Hi everyone, welcome to this morning's webinar. We're just going to give everyone another couple of minutes to get logged in and then we'll be starting. Hi everyone, welcome to this morning's webinar. I hope you're all okay, enjoying the sunshine and um, ready and comfortable, ready to go. This is our third um, webinar in the series of Open High Streets events. And um, I'm joined by a fantastic panel this morning. Um, I'll introduce you to them in a second. I'm Bev Gormley, I'm the Heritage Trust Network's Programme Manager and I manage the Open High Streets programme and also our Her Heritage Lottery Fund um, funded uh, programme as well, Unlocking the Power of Communities. They're both capacity building projects that will run over three years and hopefully you'll all be able to benefit from them in some way. Um, so as I say, this is our third event. We're using GoToWebinar, which I hope you've all found uh, easy to access. Um, and I'll get on with introducing the panellists to you. So this morning we've got Mick McGrath from Locality. They're all going to pop up on your screens now, hopefully. We've got Martin Prince Parrot from Black Swan Property. We've got Catherine Gladwell from the Refugee Support Network. And in the background, we've also got my colleague Sarah Pierce, who's HTN's uh, Development Officer for Scotland, who's working her wonders in the background, pulling the strings and answering your questions. So hopefully everything will go to plan, but if it doesn't, we'll go offline and come back on again, just in case that happens. We will keep going. So without further ado, some of you are new uh, to the Heritage Trust Network. I know that uh, lots of our members have signed up for this webinar, but also lots of people that don't really know who we are and have maybe never come across us before. Um, this programme of events is being run by us as the Heritage Trust Network in partnership with Locality, and it's funded by the Architectural Heritage Fund, um, who are also joining us today as attendees. So a little bit about HTN. We're the UK's umbrella body for people like yourselves, uh, for organisations, for local authorities. The list is endless, really, um, and not-for-profit uh, organisations who are really trying to rescue and restore historic buildings. Um, and our main focus is peer-to-peer -peer networking. We find that we've got such a wealth of experience and knowledge within the network and everybody wants to share that knowledge with other organisations or other individuals to help them along. Um, so it's really worthwhile looking into joining if you aren't a member already. Uh, we were established in 1989 as UK APT and we changed to HTN in 2016 and we've now got over 300 members of various different sizes. As I mentioned, peer-to-peer -peer networking is our forte. Um, and one of the main benefits of becoming a member is our toolkit and it's absolutely packed with advice, videos, case studies, how-to guides um, for members. It's a real, real huge benefit and we find that it's used a lot. Um, it's constantly been updated so it's well worth checking out. Uh, we also have an annual conference. Uh, this year it's going to be digital 
uh, similar to many other organisations, um, and that takes place in November, and we have lots of local events and training, and we're also developing an upcoming crowdfunding platform for our members that will help them raise those funds uh, that they badly need. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, this is our events page from, from the website, the, the web address is right at the top there. Please check out the other events that we've got coming up. You can see there are lots of open high streets events of various types with all different panellists on there. Um, but we've also got some other separate events um, coming up very soon, especially we've got choosing your legal structure for those organisations that are right at the start. Um, we've got addressing racism and heritage, which is a, a conversation that we all really badly need to have at the moment. Um, so please check those events out and uh, book onto them. So just a little bit of housekeeping. I hope you enjoy the webinar this morning. Um, if you do find that you're having any trouble with audio or video, we find that it's best if you just log out and log in again um, pretty quickly. Um, if you're joining by using a smartphone or a mobile device, you might have been given a PIN number to use when you log in. So if you do find you're having difficulties and you log back in, make sure you're inputting that PIN number if it's been given to you. Um, you'll see that this is a webinar platform, so all attendees are muted, but you have got a question box uh, where you can ask questions. There'll be a Q&A session at the end, and the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the website from next week. Um, you'll be happy to know that you'll also get an attendance certificate, mm -hmm. um, and we'll be sending you a feedback form about an hour after the webinar. I know nobody likes filling in feedback forms, but I'm sure you're all aware of funded projects and the need for um, feedback for evaluation. So please, please, if you have a couple of minutes, do fill in that feedback form for us. It'd be much appreciated. Um, you'll see that we've got an event Padlet. Um, so if you can post your questions there, that would be great. Um, we'll be using that in the question and answer session at the end. If you can't get to it or you can't use it, just post your, your questions in the, the question box here on GoToWebinar. And I think that's about it from me. So now I'm going to hand over to Mick McGrath from Locality. We're doing a little bit of a double act this morning, uh, aren't we, Mick? So I'll pass over to you. I think you need to unmute, Mick. Can you hear me? That's it, we've got you. Typical, no idea what that was about. Um, <laughs> hi, so my name's Mick McGrath, I work, work for Locality, um, and my other role today is to be a chief mitherer to make sure, you know, this all kind of goes to time. Um, we, we've got three speakers, as you can see, um, and at the end we're going to have, hopefully, as long as we need for questions and answers. So, as, as Bev has already said, do start filling out the Padlet so we can sort of uh, get some good questions to go out and we'll, we'll try and make sure there's time to answer all of those. So in terms of uh, this session, um, I work for Locality as I said and Locality are an organisation which very much believe in the power of community. Um, we're very much about supporting community businesses and really trying to help the sector be much more sustainable, viable and often that's through uh, running and owning their own facilities and ultimately being able to take control. Um, we also recently did a publication called um, Never Needed More which is very much about this whole idea of how the sectors really picked up and delivered in a time of lockdown in a way that society just would have broken down without without community groups being there to pick up the pieces. Anyhow, that's enough about that. Uh, I'll now move on to uh, what I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. So in my sort of day job, um, one of the things I also uh, am and do is I'm a resilient heritage mentor. That sounds grand. All that basically means is um, Heritage Fund put me in touch with uh, groups who may need some support around um, accessing funding, um, developing their sort of constitution, you know, all those sorts of things. And one of the groups I've been working with probably over the last, I would say over the last year is Mosley Muslim Community Hub. Uh, 
the clues in the name based in Moseley in Birmingham if any of you know it so this is just a sort of street view just to kind of give you an idea of the area next slide please thank you so the art school um, was was um, was built as a art school in the in the sort of 19th century uh, it sort of was somewhere that that in Birmingham sort of developed into folklore as you'd expect from an art school it ended up with lots of famous people going there um, so for example at the opening they had um, one of the guys from UB40 um, they've also had as sort of famous people have gone there uh, one of the singers from Fleetwood Mac um, not to mention lots of other sort of pop art and, and other sort of artists there so it, it's an it's a building which locally had developed a lot of affection but uh, when it was um, no longer used as a school it sort of ran into disrepair uh, it's grade two star listed um, and there was a real concern it was on the at-risk register and a real concern it was just going to fall to the ground so a local community group um, mostly Muslim Community Association took over the running of the building and what, what they realized is that it was really really difficult to kind of keep the building going um, in, in, in a meaningful way because as you know there's always a heritage premium with it with a sort of heritage building and the sort of costs always outweigh the actual value um, monetarily anyway so they were successful in accessing over 2.6 million pounds worth of capital funding um, which was also from architectural heritage fund amongst heritage fund and others um, they've now got a manager a caretaker cleaner post uh, there um, they have friends of the school group who are very very active in promoting it um, partly you know to celebrate the, the kind of people who went there uh, and it's got increasingly stronger wider community engagement as well so it, it's a project which is has built over time but it's it's one where it's clearly needed funding in order to make that next step progression next slide please so in terms of um, the profile of the area uh, it's out of Birmingham city centre it's probably about a mile or so out um, it's still a commercial area but uh, it very much is there about meeting local needs um, it's an area that's suffered a uh, lack of investment there's lots of historic heritage buildings around there um, in varying states of repair um, the community around there now is extremely diverse I mean uh, obviously there's a uh, quite a strong Muslim community there but you know it's it's a, a really really diverse community in terms of uh, every sort of color creed is, is there now and that's that that's, that's part of it it's sort of character now um, it's also an area which is proposed as being very close to the high-speed uh, network area so there's lots of commercial buying up of property which on one hand is great if they're going to do good things with it and that investment's going to benefit the community and it's going to mean there's there's a heritage maintained but there's also risks I mean the reality is lots of people buy property speculatively and of course the risks are in this whole climate and you know based on what we're talking about today um, who says that assumption about there's always going to be offices there's always going to be shops there's always going to be you know those things in those areas um, that assumption may be clearly does need to be challenged um, but there's also recognition that there are several heritage buildings um, nearby to bring back to life and so the good thing about that is it's developed a collaboration in the area with other heritage and community related projects um, and whether intentionally or unintentionally they are now now building up a sort of cultural heritage hub in the area which again they're, they're building that and making that one of their strengths next slide please So in terms of what, what the uh, the building offer is, uh, the focus is on community and also the creative economy. So they're using their two halls for a whole range of community events, um, wedding celebrations, you know, that those sorts of things, uh, whatever it's community want to do. Um, and they're hiring that space for those. They also have gallery space, uh, creative spaces. Um, and again, this is very much uh, building on on the sort of the original layout and design so for example in the main hall um, the way it was designed for the light coming in was so they could do their painting drawing and other sort of in a natural light so again it's sort of 
perfect for, for sort of creative people to have the right kind of environment and setting. Um, in addition, they've created offices, a co-worker space, um, and they run a series of cultural events. So other organizations now seeing them as a sort of cultural space, heritage space, and uh, buying in and hiring space. Um, but you know they're very much developing wider hub community facilities so health agencies and so forth are going in there to use use facilities because the building in itself is attracting and draws people in um, they've had lots and lots of weird quirky odd ad hoc things happen as well so for example um, they keep getting uh, doctors which is daytime tv for those people who sort of like to watch things at two o'clock and a uh, monday to friday on bbc one uh, not that i know about it um, and you know they're they're then they're being paid for that so they're, they're being very creative about uh looking for the types of right kinds of activities to go on in the building uh, they do a series of pop-up events as well and yeah ultimately as i said before it's the heritage of the building and its layout which is actually attracting people to it so you know that's really making the most of that heritage aspect next slide please So this gives you sort of ideas of now they're open, now they've been through the pain of a sort of a large capital project, you know, they've, they've had their opening, um, they had a really, really good turnout, well over 100 people, including the, um, the regional mayor, um, the social prescribing events, sort of pop-up events such as, uh, you know, a local cinema, um, all those sorts of things. So they've really sort of managed to identify what their purpose, what their brand is, and that's very much about focusing on the community, focusing on the arts aspect, and also the well-being um, of community and being flexible, having a flexible space which people um, can then use and determine how they want to use it. Next slide, please. Next slide, is it stuck? Well, this is embarrassing. Um, okay, I'll just, there we go, brilliant. So the, 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 the um, facility opened just over a year ago um, and they were starting to be really strong in terms of the earned income, making a name, developing the brand, and then COVID came along. But as they say, uh, it's, it's really important not to waste a good crisis. So uh, they were very, very quick to make sure they furloughed staff um, and the staff are now back because they've identified now is the time for them to start making plans and properly developing again. Um, it was really important for them that trustees had very much a hands-on role and did a lot of their the sort of day-to-day -day work during that furlough time and you know because they had the right kind of skills. Um, their income model, funny enough, has been hardest hit, and this is something for, that's happened to a lot of locality members. You know, we all sort of say to groups, the best kind of approach is ideally to to be able to have have a facility where you get as much earned income, so you you've got the control, you've got the power, you're not reliant on the vagaries of whether a funder wants to fund you or not. Um, but ironically, because of all of those things, um, they're the ones that have lost most of their income because the bookings haven't been happening, the rentals haven't been happening. So, you know, that has been a, a challenge. Uh, but that said, we still think that's the right kind of model to go with, whilst, of course, getting any help that, that's available at the moment. So they've accessed all the emergency funding from a range of sources, and now they're accessing a number of the recovery funding um, opportunities too, which ultimately is buying them time in order for them to be able to build up. Now, obviously, if there's a second uh, COVID wave, then potentially um, they are going to have, are going to need more help. But you know, we'll we'll worry about that one uh, further on down the line. It's also about maintaining the relationships with the funders, the clients, and the community to make sure people still know they're there, make sure that they're still still looking to open and start trading again and so forth. Um, they're reviewing their website to make the online presence better as well, to really um, make it as simple and as easy, bringing all their sort of processes such as bookings, um, payments, etc., online, so minimizing the amount of sort of paper content and so forth. Um, they're reviewing their business plan and projection assumptions too, sort of using very simple approaches such as strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats kind of approach to 
much more detailed approaches. Um, the learning about processes for opening the building as well, maintaining services and staying safe, which you know for them is um, really important. And of course, you know, this has taught them, as I'm sure it's, it's teaching you and others, that it's really important to make sure you're aware of your skills and skills gaps and to try and use this time uh, for your learning um, to sort of develop new skills and put yourselves in a better position, really. So I'm hoping Martin's going to be taking over next. Yep, he's just maybe ex gone quickly exercised his legs, but he's back now. So over to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, that was a really good presentation, Mick. I think the good thing about, I think that I liked about your presentation is um, it mirrors a lot of what's what's in this in terms of perhaps how we would approach things. So um, if I could have the next slide, please. So uh, I work for Black Swan. Uh, we are a place-led uh, property developer based in Birmingham. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've been in operation for 10 years. Um, we love heritage buildings. Um, and uh, our preferred approach is to create curated developments that integrate well into their locality. Um, and also have some resonance with the history and also the character in the community um, around the building and around the development. I personally, I'm a chartered architect. Uh, I've been practicing for uh, just over seven years now. Um, I'm fortunate to have some uh, award-winning award -winning experience with regard to um, heritage buildings, um, predominantly residential, um, but a lot of public buildings. And I'm currently the design manager for the firm. Um, ensuring that there's alignment between place, market fit, um, and design team leadership. So quite technical, but also strategic. Uh, next slide, please. And so just as a demonstration, this is one of our projects uh, on Great Hampton Street uh, in Birmingham. Um, next slide, please. And so you've gone from uh, the way it currently sits today to what our vision is for, for the place. So it's a, a family of grade two listed buildings. It's in the jewelry quarter, so it's a conservation area. Um, previously industrial, um, we're hoping to turn the top floors into residential and the bottom floors into commercial. A uh, mixture of uh, restaurants, uh, shops, um, but we have to say, uh, in light of what's happened recently, I think we'll probably be looking at probably a more interesting mix at the ground floor. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that. So next slide, please. So um, what I'm hoping to present is uh, a version of our workflow when we're trying to understand um, effectively what we have on our hands. Um, in terms of heritage assets or otherwise, um, and how we go about strategizing how to maximize the activity in and around the building um, alongside whatever we might do for sale. So next slide, please. Uh, so the scale of change, slide please. So um, I think a lot uh, in terms of what's changed can be summed up in this graph, which is from The Guardian, um, originally from Morgan Stanley, which shows that within the UK to date, uh, two thirds of uh, white collar workers, which is quite an Americanism, but white collar workers in the UK are not back in their offices. So what that means is they're at home and positively it means that they're in their communities um, I've had a, a large number of conversations and I've been following commentary around this and there's been a, uh, a rediscovery of community and a rediscovery of the relevance and the importance of the home, um, quite simply because people spend more time there. What that means commercially is 
Um, this is as probably as good a time as ever for high streets to try and reclaim the position that they held in British society um, prior to the concentration of jobs um, and economic activity within central business districts in large cities. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the scale of the opportunity doesn't look set to change. So this is a, a small slide from Microsoft based on research um, or a survey they did of 2000 members of their staff across the world, including US, UK, Germany, um, Japan and others. Um, by and large, even when hopefully things become safer, um, there is a strong sentiment and desire for people to remain at least two or three days at home to work remotely um and then the rest within uh their offices predominantly for collaboration what that means is um we don't have the full picture now in terms of the way the high street will actually function because similar to working from home we're not quite working from home or working remotely we're working during a pandemic and it's the same with high streets it's high streets during a pandemic the hope is that once things become calmer and safer um people spending more times in their communities will translate into more footfall for high streets, um, more time spent um, walking, uh, enjoying green space, um, building community, making connections, um, quite simply because working hours, uh, waking hours are spent within communities rather than at work. Um, and people realize the, the value and the benefit. I think some research done by Deloitte recently suggested that during a pandemic particularly amongst the younger generation so millennials and younger there is a concerted desire even when things recover um there's a concerted desire to try and support local businesses and i think that the shift in remote working will be part of the driver for that so there is an opportunity there and quite a large one uh next slide please so how do we capitalize Next slide, please. So um, I think it'd be important. So what we would do is we would um, we would do what's known as comp research, which is look at comparables. But um, for this, uh, I would call it uh, an audit of your context would be really important. Um, and that will form the foundation of any successful strategy that you pursue. Um, and there are two questions or two, two sorts of questions that um, I broadly say that you need to be able to answer. So the first is who. Um, that can be personal information. So who's in your community? Um, what's their age? What's their profession? What's their ethnicity? Uh, what's their geographical distribution in relation to your project? Um, you're building your asset. Um, their income level and projections. So. Um, in your locality is there projected growth in the population um is that growth predominantly driven by uh internal migration or is it predominantly driven by an increase um in the population of young people um all of those things will will help you um position yourself and your project uh, and your building um in the most effective way the way you can do that is there is an abundance of data online um there's a great deal of um, information via the ons and quite often local authorities do compile information pertaining to um particular demographic breakdowns distributions um all of those relevant things another way that you can find out is you can ask people so online polls and surveys are great um because of pandemic people are more captive now than they probably have been um, so it may be a great time to try and um, establish a digital relationship with them ahead of establishing hopefully a physical relationship in the future. Um, and the rationale behind all of that is that you have a proper grasp of your community um, and you can understand what gaps there might be in terms of services or needs or desires um, and how best to position yourself um, to fill those. Um, the trends, so the what, uh the trends or large trends which are happening in real estate now uh are health and well-being so that may manifest in the form of 
uh, running clubs, cycling clubs, distance yoga, bike repairs, things which are practical that allow people to come together um, in the pursuit of greater well-being, um, but also doesn't necessarily limit them um, in terms of space and they can be distanced while doing those things. Um, I know the uptake in runners uh, around near me has increased quite a bit, um, as has cycling. Um, so you've probably seen on the news that um, a lot of bike shops have been completely sold out. Um, and that's because people are taking up cycling as a leisure activity and an exercise activity, but also as a way of commuting uh, to work because of all the associated health benefits. Um, I would say, and, and Mick covered this uh, really well, brand is important. Um, in this context, for us, we found or we've discovered that brand is a really effective way of helping people relate to your project or relate to your relate to your building. Um, it makes it easy for them to remember. Um, and brand, when done well, is a way of communicating values as well as utility. So what you do and what's the value of what you do. Um, if you can sum that up in a, in a word or a few words or an image or a logo, um, you'll be doing quite well. I think there'll be a lot of young a lot of young people now who probably have a bit more time on their hands. So it might be a good time to um, snap up a volunteer to help you with that. That could be an idea. Um, and the rationale of all of that is if you can align your offering um, and your brand and you can target that um, in terms of the group that you want to help, not that you, you focus on that group exclusively, but you can tailor what your service is to them uh, and your communications to them, then it will save you um, utilizing a scattergun approach, you can be a lot more targeted, you can use your funds more effectively, your efforts more effectively, um, and try and hit those people. Um, next slide, please. I mean, not physically, of course. Uh, so what potential strategies are open to you? Uh, next slide. So this is very much um, a diagrammatic breakdown of, of what Mick described for um, the MMCA. So you have on the left uh, your sources of funding uh, and on the right um, your opportunities to utilize your or leverage your heritage asset um, as a space provider. Um, so crowdfunding as uh, the HTN said at the beginning of the call um, would be a great source um, for two reasons. One, uh, it's communal uh, to the terms tend to be um, uh, probably a lot more pleasant um, and also uh, crowdfunding is also a great way of gauging the level of interest um, and reach of your brand or the organization um, or the building or the locality um, so it's a great litmus test and also it can serve as a great um, confirmation of the level of support which can help you secure more support grants of course um, I suspect many of you will be familiar with um, lenders um, I'm not too sure it's something we would look at I'm not too sure how much uh, institutional capital there is available uh, for projects and heritage assets but I suspect there's some um, and then of course there's also donations via private funding and high net worth individuals um, in times like this, it may not go amiss to have conversations with people who may have donated in the past and see if they if they feel like donating anytime now. On the other side, on the income side, um, there are lots of ways you can you can skin that cap. Um, you have informal users. Um, this is utilizing your space on an hourly, using daily rates. Uh, micro spaces. Micro workspaces are very popular now. Um, a lot of people are working from home and where they work is not optimized for working, it's optimized for living. Um, even people who do have probably better setups are actively looking for places where they can safely work um, in a micro environment that operates as a third space. So somewhere that isn't home and it isn't work, but still allows them to be productive. And it's just a change of scenery. I think tapping into that would be smart. There's a lot of talk within the commercial real estate sector about flexible work hubs. Um, so um, flexible uh, workspaces, co-working spaces in suburban locations that would allow for staff to, to meet or work there as opposed to going to the headquarters. Um, developer partnerships could be something that you wanted to look at. Um, developers are very good at 
um, envisioning a new future for the building um, and generally a clue into what's happening from a market perspective and also a funding perspective, projects of that kind. You may want a service in kind tenant. So um, the upset has probably left a lot of businesses looking at what their overheads are. Um, and for many of them, what's driven the move to being a remote 100% has been um, the real estate cost of their offices. So if they've been able to break a lease or a lease has ended around that time, then um, they may be able to take a space. Um, and if they have complementary services, then perhaps they pay um, for that space in the form of um, a skill that you may require. So it might be advertising, um, design, architecture, um, a whole range of things are available to you. Arts partnerships are very much the same. Um, they're also struggling. Um, creative, uh, the creative arts and also creative communities are a great way of activating and building community in a place. Um, and then there's normal tenant lease. So this is quite long, um, but your normal tenants uh, are what you'd expect. So shops, uh, offices, um, tenants like that. What's changed recently or will come in effect from the 1st of September is that you will no longer need to issue a planning change of use for your space and that's opened up a whole range of different uses um, and potentially different tenants for you so um, you can freely move from having a shop to having a professional services office to having a restaurant and cafe a drinking establishment uh, a research and development space light industrial space uh, a gym a crash and a clinic so what that means is the pool available to you in terms of organizations and companies that you can attract um, has increased um, and for us as a developer we're excited about that because it allows us to probably have within our commercial spaces uses that will add more value overall to not just the community but also um, the purchases of our our homes and crucially all of your spaces need to be COVID secure so next slide please so COVID measures um, next slide please so uh, these are just suggestions uh, what I would recommend is if you aren't sure there are companies like British Land and um, a few others predominantly in the commercial real estate sector because they've been most anxious about the change that have issued documents which outline the ways that you can make your your space more COVID secure. So that includes contactless buttons and access, um, temperature checks via laser thermometers, uh, waivers at entrances, um, ample ventilation, uh, multiple hand washing, disinfecting stations, mask wearing and mask vending machines. So there are a number of things you can do. They're not particularly onerous, um, but together they can be quite powerful when combined. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so to summarize, so working from home seems here to stay. Um, I think that's a massive opportunity for high streets and communities, um, especially as lockdown starts to ease even more. Um, I think a local audit of your community and your locality is probably really important, even if you've already done one, um, depending on the last time you did it, just to understand um, who you're trying to serve um, and what, what your community looks like, really, in terms of numbers. Um, the activities connected, so health and workspace are amongst the most popular uses that people are looking for now um, in terms of their interests. Um, and then combining funding streams, so I, as Mick said, I would recommend um, having a situation where you have uh, fixed leaseholders who are effectively subsidizing some of your other activities. Ideally, you would have a mixture of uses and businesses which complement each other and reinforce whichever brand you've chosen to develop. Um, and hopefully that will help you achieve some level of harmony and also um, commercial resilience um, if there is another upset. Um, and COVID secure premises. So the desire for people to leave their homes and go elsewhere is there. Um, the key that would unlock that is um, uh, confidence. Is confidence that where they're going, um, they'll be safe, 
if you can provide that for your communications um, and demonstrate that actively, I can't see any real reason why why people wouldn't want to um, to visit your building or visit your location. Uh, next slide, please. And slide again. Thank you. Over to Catherine. Thanks, Martin, and thanks, Mick, as well. I feel like I've um, learned some very useful things for our project just from uh, listening to you both this morning. So that's been great. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so um, I'm Catherine, I'm Chief Executive at Refugee Support Network, and we're a charity working to help young refugees get into, stay in, and then progress in education. Um, could I get the next slide, please? So um, we started as a small um, volunteer-led project in Harlesden nine years ago. Um, we were providing community based educational mentoring, uh, which is essentially a blend of um, academic tutoring with kind of well-being support integrated into it for unaccompanied refugee children in our local area. Um, and over the last few years, our work has grown. Um, we now work with about 500 young people each year uh, through education support hubs across London, Birmingham, Oxford, Cambridge and Peterborough. Um, though still, um, and this is representative of where the majority of young refugees are, about 50% of our work happens um, in London from our original Harlesden community. Um, so we have over the years rented um, a number of uh, office spaces and project spaces from different people. Um, and we're currently renting um, some space in a community centre um, in Harlesden, uh, but we have hugely um, outgrown the space to the extent that uh, you can, if you happen to visit us um, in a kind of pre-lockdown uh, day in Harlesden, you might find people meeting in a disused lift shaft, uh, you might find people taking phone calls sitting on the staircase. Um, there was uh, very little space and it really wasn't um, an appropriate space for um, the type of uh, confidential or sensitive work that we were doing with young people. Um, we also discovered, uh, kind of kind of happily, given that we were outgrowing the space, um, that the community centre that we were in was about to be knocked down. Um, that still hasn't happened, but that building is still scheduled for demolition um, later on this year. Um, alongside that, we had always dreamt of having a space where we would be able to uh, be flexible in the activities that we ran for young people, where we could create a sense of welcome and belonging um, for young people in our community and from other communities um, across London. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking you through um, briefly the purchase, the refurb and the usage. Um, and for each of those things, I'll just tell you um, a little snippet of our story and then a couple of lessons that we've learned from that process that I hope might be um, of some use or interest. So um, uh, the purchase, um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, and um, as the next slide is coming, I'll um, just say that uh, we this opportunity came up um, completely out of the blue for us. Uh, we, we happened to be in this situation when we were outgrowing our current space and our office was about to be knocked down. Um, and then uh, one day I was walking down the road of my, my local high street, and um, I also live in the area, and noticed this big kind of yellow for sale sign outside of this beautiful building that had just been derelict um, and abandoned for about four years. Um, it, it was previously an HSBC bank. Um, and just thought, oh, it's completely unrealistic. There's no point even looking into this. But um, I'm a kind of eternal optimist, so I, I, I looked into it. Um, and, and again, it felt, it felt impossible. Um, so uh, it was on the market for £1.1 million. Pounds. Um, we had um, £300,000 of uh, organisational savings and donations that had come in specifically for us at some point to invest um, in a building. Um, we uh, we also managed quite rapidly to get a hundred thousand pound investment from 
from a partner church that we'd worked with for many years. Um, and then after about three months of stress testing um, our finances, we secured a mortgage um, in principle of £700,000 from Charity Bank. Um, so we uh, put in an offer and were uh, quite excited about what might happen. We then heard that the building had been sold to another local organisation. So, you know, we were disappointed, but we, we like and respect this other organization and just thought, okay, so it obviously wasn't meant to be, um, we'll, but our appetite is whetted for um, having some space and we'll keep looking. Um, about four months later, uh, I got a call from the estate agent saying the other charity has pulled out and they've recommended that we try and sell to you instead. Are you still interested? And so we, um, had to you know, rapidly uh, pull things together and um, thankfully we had um, kept all of the wheels turning on um, mortgages and finance and business planning in the hope that a different property might come onto the market um, and were able to pivot um, back to this one which is what we had originally originally hoped for and we completed the purchase on the 6th of March this year uh, with absolutely no idea uh, what was around the corner in terms of COVID and lockdown. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, could I have the next slide, please? So we have, uh, we learned a few lessons um, from this process. Um, firstly, we learned that buying in community, buying in a community can consortium um, is complex. So we began this process as a consortium of local partners, us Refugee Support Network, um, a local social enterprise doing um, research and development, um, and uh, a partner church and a partner debt advice charity. And our original hope would be that we would be able to come up with a kind of complex arrangement reflecting everybody's various levels of um, income reserves and um, deposit capacity um, and buy um, in a in a consortium structured together. Um, it is possible to do that um, and um, it's actually a common, it's fairly common for um, community groups to start out hoping that they can buy a building um, in partnership and find that it's um, very complicated. So we were advised by um, our mortgage lender and various other advisors that we spoke to to select a lead partner. Um, and for various reasons, we were the only organization um, in a position to do that. Um, and so that's how we chose to progress. And I think the main learning for us from that was um, that there are ways to keep what we had hoped for in terms of sense of um, shared a sense of shared ownership and buy-in, high levels of buy-in um, from multiple organisations, even if ownership is with one. And so we find some creative ways of, of maintaining that for the other organisations through um, uh, investments um, and arrangements around long-term lease and involvement in uh, steering groups and strategy groups or in terms of what the building was going to um, ultimately look like and do. Um, so secondly, um, investors come from long-term relationships. Um, I think as always, when it comes to buying um, large property, it's a long and drawn out process, but in that uh, it was full of rapid deadlines where we had to be able to move quickly. Um, and actually we were only able to do what we did because of the strength of relationships that we had already built in our local community. Um, and e that's even though we are um, a national charity, um, we've not neglected the, the local um, in that. And so from the other partner charity who had to pull out, um, being generous enough and us having a strong enough relationship with them that they would recommend um, that the seller sell to us and having that relationship that had been built over years with one of the local churches such that with um, within about a month they had agreed to invest £100,000 um, which in credit to them is about 80% of their entire um, bank account um, into, into the purchase of this building. Um, and none of that would have been possible if we'd had to build those relationships and build that trust from scratch um, in the hope of getting rapid decisions. Um, and then lastly, long-term business planning, consultation and partnerships really do need to be prioritised from the outset. It's not okay to start that after the purchase has been completed. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the other charity um, had to pull out in that they, their enthusiasm led them to make the offer first 
and then once that offer had been accepted start to do financial planning start to do community consultation um, and gradually start to realize that actually it wasn't going to work out as they had planned um, we'd um, been fortunate enough to have been in the position to have done that financial planning and community consultation before um, putting in an offer on the building so we were then able to um, able to move more quickly and it also able to have a clear vision of what we wanted for that building and what we wanted to achieve for our community um, and strong evidence that local people supported that um, and that was necessary at every stage from negotiations on price with the vendor um, to demonstrating um, social impact for the mortgage acquisition and um, because it was a you know, specific charity mortgage from charity bank and um, through to funding applications um, that we're doing right up to um, right up to today um, Okay, could I get the next slide, please? And we'll move on to um, the refurb. So I should say at this point that we have ended up with a heritage building entirely by accident. Um, could I have the next slide? Please. We um we didn't start out uh, thinking oh wouldn't it be great if we had you know the most beautiful building in town that had this heritage value and we could bring it back to life in the community that honestly wasn't um wasn't where we started from we just wanted a space um where we could run um positive activities for local young people and this was the building that happened to come onto the market so it's been a really um incredible learning curve for us to start to understand the added value that having having acquired this heritage building what that really means and how um how that's going to bring even more to our project but we're coming at it um from a place of zero heritage expertise um and um the building has been uh, abandoned for for four years it um it, it was practically derelict um and it needs a major refurb just to create a safe working environment um even before we start to think about creative um creative uses um so it's a it's a major job um that we have on our hands and obviously um having built in march and then gone having bought in march and then gone straight into lockdown we're only at the beginning of this process um so could i get the next slide please um, and uh, we've managed to learn a few lessons over the last few months, even though um, we're only at the start of the process. Um, firstly, we've learned um, lessons around partnerships and funding. Um, and obviously, community initiatives on high streets will always require funding and partnerships. So how can we make that work best? Um, the first thing that we've learned links back to what I was saying, um, which is um, partner for expertise, not just for finance. Um, so we have been incredibly fortunate um, to get funding from the Arch Architectural Heritage Fund um, and from um, Historic England. Um, and to be able to pull a number of advisors um, into the project. And uh, that's been uh, immensely valuable um even if what we first saw um you know when someone sent us the the link to the application was oh it's a chance to get some money to pay for the refurb um what we've got and what we are getting um is so much is so much more than that um secondly don't neglect the local authority in terms of partnership building um we've had a, a fantastic relationship with london borough of brent which is where we're based and it's been absolutely critical um to this project um as a result of that relationship we've um, been able to link up with a, a number of other um key um priority sites in the local neighborhood plan that are also being redeveloped over the next few years make sure that we're doing things um in a joined up way um, and they've also um, funded as a, you know, a really significant portion of the refurb budget um, through the local um, SIL funding. Um, and finally consider cash flow in terms of funding and partnerships. Um, funding comes in many different shapes and sizes and uh, Martin was alluding to this earlier um, and we've got a, a range of a range of terms on the grants that we have um, been awarded for this building that range from um, payments on the completion of the project to payment of a percentage of each invoice um, on presentation of invoice throughout um, to proportional instalments with invoices to follow um, to cash grant upfront um, and if you're going to manage your cash flow throughout the refurb you need to make sure that you've got the right blend of money um, to enable you to do that if everything's payment on completion or payment on presentation of invoices then obviously as a charity um, without massive reserves to draw and you're going to run into serious cash flow problems 
Um, in terms of process, um, again, something that comes into play with a lot of community projects is um, very generous practitioners um, and contractors and consultants offering services um, for reduced rates, which is absolutely brilliant um, but I think our learning has been that um, it, particularly as people who are coming to this without expert expertise in this field is the need to be really clear up front about what the expectations are and what the quality standards that need to be met are um, because otherwise you can find yourself in a situation where you get a couple of months in and suddenly discover that something that you had just assumed would be covered actually isn't and have to backtrack um, and uh, linking back to what I was saying about partnering for expertise um, it, getting funding from organizations who have requirements about um, the types of contract and the types of insurance and the types of um, you know reba standards that will be met throughout actually is really helpful because um, it enables you to um, have those conversations with people who are being incredibly generous with their time and expertise but also to make sure that um, you don't find yourself in a tricky situation afterwards. Um, it, COVID-19, um, we've talked a bit about that and it's been amazing to hear um, your both of your reflections on that. We're in a really happy position, I am telling myself, <laughs> I'm choosing to look on the bright side, that we, um, we are um, refurbing this building with the knowledge of coronavirus and so we've got the opportunity to make sure that we're integrating some of these things around wellness um, and COVID secure security right from the start. Um, obviously that has budget implications which I don't have the answer to yet because it's come out um, you know since a lot of our budgets were agreed but at least we have the knowledge that means that we can do what we can do at this stage rather than trying to retrofit um, later on in the day. Um, time frames I'm not going to labour because it's a blatantly obvious point to everybody I'm sure that um, uh, that already um, we're we're seeing that time frames are never going to be what you originally think they're going to be particularly when you're working um, in a lockdown um, and lastly the eternal reworking of budgets so um, when you're in a situation when you're trying to apply for funding for a project you often have to um, put budgets together before you've been able to tender um, so you end up putting budgets together that are based on best estimates of people who have got you know a certain amount of expertise that have advised you um, you then tender and find that there are um, different costs and so then have to go through a process of redoing those budgets with donors and some people are open to that and some people aren't um, and so I, I think that's been a learning for us that um, there's a need in these things when you're putting together budgets um, obviously you're doing it um, to the greatest level of accuracy that, that is possible with the information that you have at the time but to have explicit and transparent conversations with donors up front um, as we've been able to do with AHF who've been um, you know one of the very good donors in this context um, about the need to um, get grant variations and um, changes to budget lines as more costs come in because not everybody is as open to that as as they as they are um, and finally, um, ensuring that community voices are heard throughout the refurb. It's, it's not enough just to consult at the beginning and then invite everyone to a big opening, um, opening event. Um, and part of the reason for that is that there are inevitable changes um, and you want to keep people on the journey with you. And that's time consuming, but it's necessary. Um, we set up working groups and uh, partnerships with our youth advisory board. Um, you know, people are emotionally invested and if we want them to stay emotionally invested, then um, we need to invest in them throughout the process. Um, finally, uh, next slide, please. Um, usage and you can go straight through to the slide after that as well. Um, so our our vision um, for the building is to have two floors of community space, the basement and the ground floor, um, where there will be youth space, um, space for other local projects to um, run activities, um, and two floors of uh, office and meeting space, so flexible workspace for us, um, our partners and other local charities or social enterprises. Um, what we most want to, to create is a place of belonging and community. Um, Brent is one of the neighbourhoods most badly affected by COVID-19 and that is as a result of the huge inequalities that already were present um, in, our, in our local authority. Um, 
we know from our work over the last 10 years that young refugees and other young people um, who are disadvantaged in whatever way need community and connection um, and that's more the case than ever now um, and uh, we want this building to be a place where um, these connections can start to happen and um, as we create a kind of education centre for young refugees and a broader social impact hub for Harlesden um, we hope that it's a place where some of those inequalities and particularly the education inequalities that have been exacerbated by lockdown can start to be equalised. Um, clearly we still have a while to go before we're in the building and um, we're aiming for June 2021 at present um, but um, we've still uh, got a couple of early emerging lessons learned um, so if I could get the last slide please that would be great. Uh, so um, I think as a community hub on the high street, um, working with um, groups of disadvantaged or um, vulnerable young people, uh, you have this kind of eternal tension between the desire to create a third space and the need to create a safe space. Um, and you hope that it's going to be possible to do both. So um, one of the local authority um, priorities, you know, rightly, is the kind of open door high street idea and creating a maximizing third space. Um, we work with with young refugees and survivors of trafficking and safeguarding is also a priority. Um, so we've been working to try and find um, creative solutions to that. Um, so at the moment we're exploring things like um, kind of a glass, a kind of a fairly large glass walled lobby um, using the design to create a sense of openness and inclusive, inclusivity and being able to see right into the whole of the ground floor um, whilst maintaining safety for young people. Um, so getting away from an idea of stuff just happening behind closed doors but also not allowing just anybody to walk in off the street when there might be um, sensitive activities going on in a building um, but making sure that a timetable for community use activities and times when the building will be open and times when it won't be open um, is clearly visible. Um, secondly, um, and again as a community space, this balance between generosity and income generation um, or hopefully both um, you know, we're a charity, um, the charities and the social enterprises that we hope will use the building are unlikely to be able to afford market rates and yet we want to be able to capitalise um, on the things that Mick was talking about um, uh, in terms of income generation from the building. Um, so our business plan aims to have RSN um, paying less per month on the building than we would pay to rent space elsewhere um, within two years and therefore kind of reducing our expenditure um, over that time frame. Um, and one of the ways that we want to do that um, is um, of course renting out space to other organisations but also capitalising on the option to include event space. Um, we have a, a very diverse neighbourhood um, in Halston and um, it, it always scores very highly on deprivation indexes but um, there are businesses and families in our area who are able to pay to pay market rates to rent space um, and we want to create a kind of open event space in the loft and um, with views over the high street um, to target that market um, there's no other space like that um, for events or parties or um, you know, even local wedding receptions or anything like that locally um, and the hope is that then that will contribute some way to allowing us to offer low-cost space to local initiatives um, um, whose work benefits the community and who don't have space at the moment precisely because they can't afford market rents. Um, we're also looking at um, uh, scales of rents um, for short-term tenants and long-term anchor tenants to provide that balance of income and security as well. Um, and lastly, um, planning for an unknown future, um, owning a building in the world of COVID-19. Uh, being entirely honest, I have on multiple occasions thought the timing of this was incredible. We've just bought a building and now no one wants to come to work. You know, two floors of it were originally designed to be desk space. Um, we had uh, thought about putting in as many hot desks as we could um, and using them ourselves and renting them out. Um, and now we're asking the questions that everybody's asking around how organizations will use space um, in the future. What What is the future of work? Um, and we're pivoting to um, a more creative and collaborative space, um, making sure that um, as well as having space for 
those who do want to to return to work um, that we've got space for local you new know, local team away days with flexible rent structures for those who are working presently working from home but as has been mentioned already um, don't have a, a really positive setup to enable them to do that effectively um, want to want to work in an office two days a week or want to bring a team in two days a week um, we don't know the answers um, uh, We've read the research, um, but we recognise that you know all of us are dealing with a lot of unknowns. Um, but asking the questions um, and continuing to ask the questions and be re being ready to respond, I think, is key um, if we're to succeed in bringing life-filled community initiatives to struggling high streets, which is um, what we all want to do. Um, and that's all that, all that I've got for us today. Thank you. Great, thanks for that, Catherine. Um, okay, we've now got time for questions. Uh, just before we do that, I suppose uh, something I was struck by all three of us said was um, a word that we all brought up was hubs. Um, now, for some people, hubs just kind of mean that's just another buzzword that you use to get funding, isn't it? Well, no, it isn't. It's about having a flexible space with multiple uses uh, which reflect local needs. So, you know, I think it's really, really important to sort of think about whatever space you get as a flexible space. But anyway, we'll move move on to the sort of questions now. Um, okay, I think this is one for you, Catherine, but it says, what do you mean by third space? Oh, yeah, um, so that's the, the, the term that our local authority has been using to refer to um, what I think Martin described as not work and not home, um, but a place that is open for the community to come and to meet and connect and engage in various different activities. Um, but not in the home, not in their friend's home, um, and not in not in the work. And also importantly, not in um, not in somewhere where you have to pay to get in. Okay, great. And there's a follow-on question. There are, there are quite a few now, so that's good. Um, community users will often want free or cheap space. How do you make sure your building can, will still be financially viable? Um, I guess that's for, for both of you, and I'll probably chip in as well. Um free and cheap space versus viability. Someone has to pay for it. Um, in a blunt way, you'd have to find someone who's willing to pay for it. So that's why um, I was proposing that you have um, tenants who are, as Catherine suggested, are paying market rates, um, and they will effectively be subsidizing the other uses. Um, beyond that, um, it may be a matter of looking at how you structure the pricing. So how much space for how long um, you may be able to acquiesce to what they require. Um, if they need, uh, you know, a, a, a medium sized room for half a day. If that's covered in terms of um, the rest of your cash flow, then there's no reason why you can't supply it for a small amount. Um, sponsorship is also something else. Um, so you may be able to have local businesses or organisations sponsor a space, so they're effectively paying the, the rent or the lease for that space, which allows for the community to use it. Um, it might be a good halfway house between um, uh, investing a lot in a specific organisation uh, or investing a lot in a specific building if they're able to sponsor a meeting room. Um, and the catering and the bills which may be associated with that meeting room then then that might be a nice a nice place which is a sufficient amount for uh, for what you require but is also um, not too much of a commitment for that organization so that might be something you can do as well thanks Martin Catherine anything around that um, yeah, I, firstly I absolutely love the idea of getting um, local businesses to sponsor a rooms or space I'm I'm knitting that down and taking it on board. Um, I think for us, uh, we one of one of the things that we had to get in place in order to um, get our mortgage approved was to show that we um, had enough you know, secured income from the building to make it viable. Um, and so we needed to have those anchor tenants. Um, and it links back to what I was saying about um, having started off wanting to buy in partnership. We then went to an arrangement where we weren't all buying, but some of those partners who wanted a long-term stake in the building have signed up to be long-term anchor tenants and so 
um, having we've got two, um, possibly three long term anchor tenants um, for the building and having that stability and knowing that they're paying something that is closer to market rates um, then gives us the flexibility to offer um, cheaper space to others. Okay, that's brilliant. I suppose the other thing I'd chip in there with um, is the idea of free. Freeze can be quite damaging to organisations. One, there's no such thing as free in terms of costs. There's always costs. So um, with the locality members, very often the, the mantra is, yes, we will look for charges, but you know they'll obviously be minimal for those least able to afford and maximise for those most able to pay. So the idea of cross subsidising um, is, is, is an important one. Um, recognizing that um, okay we'll move on to um, with COVID meaning that it's not yet possible for groups to meet indoors should we be thinking about changing our planned uses is it better to think long term and keep larger spaces within the building or play it safe and create smaller units that could be at could at least bring in some income now. So I guess the answer to that is form's got to follow function. You should have done your homework, your research to know what kind of space you need. I mean, generally the, the approach is that a larger space, a flexible space um, is one which means it can be turned to a range of different uses. Um, but you know, you, you do you do clearly need to think about that. Um, so from from Martin, Catherine, any sort of views around that? Um well, you're going to be constrained by what your building can do, to be quite honest. Um, some buildings, I would avoid I would avoid spaces without windows. So quite often um, on our developments and our projects, windows are, they decide layouts almost more than anything else. Um, as Mick said, uh, doing an audit of, of what kind of use um, would be important. But I think because of the uncertainty, I mean, the approach that we're taking with our developments now is we is we have a plan A and a plan B uh, for spaces, so um, or even floor plates, depending on the size of the building. So um, we have what our plan A is, and then we also sort of run um, a simulation suggesting, okay, if X happens in the future and that's not viable, um, how quickly and how easily could we move to B and how much would that cost? So, for example, if you um, if you wanted to start with cellularized spaces, um, depending on your, on your window provision, then you may also want to secure a cost. How much and how long would it take to bring some of those walls down if you had to, for example? Um, okay, thank you. Just so you're not moving in, in, in a blind way. Great, thanks, Martin. Catherine, anything around that? Um, I think um, we're we're limited in terms of not having any outdoor space um, to play with. But in terms of the indoor space, um, it's really informed how we've thought about the ground floor. Um, so in terms of the design and layout, we've kept that as flexible as possible, and we've got you know, four or five different um, setups that can be put up you know, immediately overnight. Um, so although um, Sadly, we one of our one of our main assets is the basement, which obviously doesn't have any windows. Um, we're maximising um, within the constraints of the building um, where there is open space and um, keeping it as flexible as we possibly can. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so hopefully um, we're supposed to finish now. But if people are okay, because there are a number of questions and we seem to have a flow, we'll carry on for another ten minutes if that's okay. Um, Okay, so I'll carry on with one here. Um, how do you persuade a local authority that buildings they own can be used for local benefit rather than just selling to speculators? I guess I'll kick that one off in terms of, uh, it, I think it partly depends who you talk to in the local authority. If you talk to someone in the estates team, they're very often their their remit and role is to get as much income as it possibly can from from uh, any sort of buildings or property they're looking to sell. So you know their agenda may not be that sympathetic. So alternatively, the the local councillor, the local communities team may be far more uh, warm to your ideas. So you know that that's the way of sort of choosing and finding out who are the right people to to help and support you identify the blockers. The other thing as well is to maybe do something called registering uh, as an asset of community value, which is a process um, virtually all local authorities should have examples on their website where you can put forward a proposal as to why you think a, an asset should be uh, protected and that 
potentially provides you with the opportunity within five years of, um, of being able to um, raise money should it come on the open market. It doesn't necessarily mean that will happen, but it means it buys you some time should you be in a position where a property does come on the market, then you'll have up to six months in order to put a proposal together. Um, is there anything else you, you do want to add to that? Um, I, I would just say for us, um, something that was really significant was working with the local um, neighbourhood plan. So the building that we um, have bought is a, um, um, a, a designated non-heritage asset in the local neighbourhood plan. And so that, um, that enabled us to start the conversation with the local authority because they'd already, or the, the, the group that was doing the local neighbourhood plan had already identified the building um, as being um, prioritised for community use. Um, and so that was a really helpful starting point for us. So um, finding out when your next local neighbourhood plan is due to be done, linking in with people who are writing that and making sure that you're on the same page, I think is a good start. Okay, brilliant. Martin? No, no comment from me. Okay, brilliant. Well, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep going then. Um, business planning and stress testing uh, that Catherine mentioned, we find is the hardest part for any community organisation. It's a very specific skill. Any suggestions on how best to do this and how to assess rates for spaces, for COVID secure spaces, when destiny of spaces will be reduced, uh, sorry, density of spaces will be reduced and different? to standard rates. So yeah, Catherine, I guess that's one for you. Yeah, um so we were we're we're fortunate enough to have a really um brilliant head of operations who uh, did a great job of doing some initial um, financial planning for us. Um, but if you are able to partner with somebody like Charity Bank, then that actual stress testing process is done by them. So you don't have to like, have that in-house in expertise yourself. And they're really brilliant at just getting alongside you and working with you and knowing that you know, they want you to succeed. They want you to be able to um, have the impact, the, the best impact in your community. Um, so you can, you know, you don't have to be able to do that yourself and certainly wouldn't have been able to complete that um, process yourself. Um, in terms of assessing rates for spaces, for COVID secure spaces, I mean, I think it's very, very early days um, for that at the moment. Um, and I, I, we've been, we've been looking around at sort of different um, comparison rents on workspaces and other sort of social impact hubs. Um, across London and none of them so far are um, including that in their rates or have integrated that into their rates. So I think it's quite early days to be trying to put actual figures on things. Um, and what we're trying to do is just in our own planning recognise that we're no longer going to get a uh, or at least in the near future, we're unlikely to get the main portion of income from the building being from fitting in as many hot desks as possible. And so we need to think creatively about the other uses and how we um, how we kind of monetize um, the fact that people will want to have team away days, but most of the time work from home and that type of thing, um, rather than trying to put figures on having you know, four desks in a big room um, at the moment. But um, I think that stuff will come later. Okay, great. Uh, here's a question for you, Martin. Um, you mentioned the role that heritage assets can play in anchoring a place-based development or scheme. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think is the particular strength of a heritage building in this context? Is it civic pride, quality of building, role in local history? And how can those seeking to save historic buildings help promote um, it's all of them, actually. I think that the most, I think what we've experienced is that the most, okay, if we rewind. So broadly speaking, heritage assets have a very, very positive place within um, our collective um, conscious uh, and understanding of place. Um, regardless almost regardless of age group um everybody tends to prefer um older more classical buildings to uh more modern buildings um that has all sorts of reasons to do with construction and materials and quality and 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 romantic ideas what i think or what we found is the most potent is when you compare an existing building with an exciting vision for the future um, not just for the building, but for uh, what's happening in the community. 
Um, how can you, uh, for those seeking to save heritage buildings, how can you promote these strengths to the community? Um, I think it may be something as simple as if you own the building, um, inviting people in as long as it's safe. Um, making and publicizing and digitizing the history of the building um, and making it as personal and relatable as possible. So I think the mistake that quite often happens within the heritage space with regard to buildings is the the stories about the buildings can be a little bit sterile. It was built in 1800s. Uh, you used to have textile materials here, blah, 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 blah. I think if you're able to anchor the building and relate it to the people, that used it, how many people used it, what sort of life did they have, um, how often were they there, did they love it, did people fight for it, who owned it, what did the person who owned it do, um, really start to anchor it in human experience and human um, feeling, I think makes heritage buildings more human. And that's ultimately the reason why I think people would, would probably plump to support them more overtly. Um, and I definitely think digitizing their presence is really important as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Martin. Actually, the um, Mosley hub I was talking about earlier on, that's something they've worked very hard on, partly because of the friends group, but but also because that's its history. That That's what, what, what made it special to people and kept keeping that alive. So, um, OK, maybe I have time for one last one then, and then we'll wrap up. So uh, what can you do with the design of a space to ensure that it's truly, sorry, no, it's not that one. Um, how can you make high street buildings more accessible? Um, you know, they're very often, they're sort of pokey spaces, difficult to put in lifts, all those sorts of things. But so yeah, how, how do you deal with the um, making them more accessible? You can go, Catherine, if you'd like. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so we are, we're having to, um, widen the lift shaft that is in our building it's currently um like completely dysfunctional and also not um not big enough for a standard size wheelchair um, so the lift shaft needs to be widened and it also needs to be extended um, to go you know, to, to cover the entirety of the building um, and it is it's it's one of the biggest expenses um, in in the refurb um, in terms of individual individual line items um, but we've we've just um, you know come from the outset that there, there's there's no choice you have to you, you know you want you want to do whatever you can to make the building as accessible as it can be and um we would prefer to have to um reduce costs on other things than ever find ourselves in a situation where we have to say to somebody i'm sorry we chose not to put in a, a, a not to put in a lift that was suitable for you um so um the prioritizing the lift um even at the expense of other things looking at um a disabled toilet access um i think uh it, fairly basic things but in in i think is the case as i'm you know, starting to learn it it's it's not a it's not a given that these things are automatically put into and um, buildings of its age and structure um, and uh, so it's something that just have to prioritize when they get there okay martin very quickly you've got anything to add um i'd say if you can conceive of the building and its uses depending on where you are in the life cycle from uh from an access perspective first and then work towards able access um that will make things a lot easier so even if you have a multi-floored building the way you sequence your spaces in terms of what you put on the ground floor what you put on the first floor um for example mm -hmm. is one way you could do that um the other one probably is if you're talking about vertical circulation is looking at um mezzanines and platform lifts as opposed to completely um contained lift shafts i mean small ward portion with lifts um they are expensive a cheap lift will cost you in maintenance and that's it so just be careful with that yeah okay that's great thank you martin um so i, I think we're done at this point uh Catherine, we'll hand over to you can I just tag on to that question at, at the end about accessibility? Um, the Heritage Trust Network has got a workshop, it's a two-day workshop uh, coming up in the next couple of months, 
makes on easy access to high street buildings. So if anybody's interested in, in that subject, um, we've got the workshop for you. You can check out the events page on the website. Okay, so I, th I think we're done now in terms of this part. So, um, Bev, do you want to sort of uh, close down? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody uh, for attending and thank you to our amazing panellists. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I'm glad that I've been in the background, just being able to soak it all up and take it all in. Um, apologies for the lag in uh, some of the, uh, some of the slides. The Wi-Fi where I am isn't very good. So we've done our best. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate to please check out our events page on the website because we've got so many events coming up um, over the next couple of months that I'm sure you'll be interested in. And also, if you're if your project is at the early stage or if you're at a later stage, we're currently setting up um, two Google groups so that you can uh, network with your peers uh, and yourself and get advice, share the issues that you're, you're facing. So if you want to drop me an email to let me know if you want to join one of those groups, then please do. Um, we've got a discussion group for later stage projects that I think is next week. Um, so just let me know, please. Um, also, we've got the Open High Streets mailing list. So if you want to know when any events are coming up or any training courses uh, over the next three years, if you drop me a line again, I'll add you to that, that mailing list um, and you'll know first. But please, please, as I said at the start, if you could please fill in the feedback form that we sent you, we send you after this. Um, I would absolutely love you all forever. It would be fantastic and make my job so much easier. Um, but that's it really. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the panelists and we'll see you all at the next event. We'll say bye Cheers. for now. Bye. Bye. bye.